support of the ranking member's amendment, uh, and I certainly agree with the uh, chairman's um, interpretation of the uh, amendment construction. Uh, I mean, for example, I assume that nothing in this amendment curtails the Federal Reserve's 13-3 exigent powers that we know have been exercised rather vigorously uh, over the last uh, 12 months. But I do think it's very, very important at this point in uh, our economic, uh, uh, in, this, in the midst of this continuing economic turmoil, uh, that we talk about some type of exit strategy from the incredible massive leveraging of taxpayer funds in our economy. And I'm still somewhat fearful, and, and whatever the beneficial impact of the ESA law was back when it was passed roughly a year ago. Uh, I am fearful, though, that if we uh, in Congress, if the Federal Reserve is not intelligent in how to start laying down the predicate that the federal government is going to get out of the bailout business, and to a great extent, I think I've heard a, a, a fairly unified chorus amongst this committee that we want to get out of the bailout business. Now, we may differ on how best to do that, but ultimately, uh, risk capital uh, is, is, as defined, risk capital, and the risk shouldn't be on the taxpayer. Uh, it ought to be on the investor. So we can have those debates, but my point is, you know, I, I've been here for almost eight years now, and I remember the Fannie and Freddie debates. Oh, well, there's no government guarantee. There's no government guarantee. Well, guess what? What was once implicit turned out to be explicit. Uh, and we know where we are today. Mr. Lockhart had said we're looking at probably a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars uh, of taxpayer bailout exposure. Wouldn't it be nice that one place, one place in law, we, we start to set the precedent that the federal taxpayer is getting out of the bailout business? Uh, otherwise, we are creating, we are, we are laying the groundwork for perhaps even a larger bubble to go through the system in the future. I mean, that's the whole Fannie and Freddie story. It had no credibility because it wasn't written into law. There was no credibility. Everybody knew if Fannie and Freddie ultimately got into trouble, that the taxpayer would be forced to bail them out, and lo and behold, the taxpayer was forced to bail them out. So if you want to get out of the bailout business, why not begin in taking a modest step today and saying, here, in one place in law, we're going to write the fact that we're going to get out of the bailout business. And by the way, you know, for those who say that somehow if we force more of the um, uh, derivatives uh, onto, um, um, into a clearinghouse, well, I mean, if you're doing that to lessen risk, then Theoretically, bailouts aren't going to be necessary. I must admit it's been a little bit lost on me that if you have risk spread out in an atomistic fashion in the economy and then somehow you aggregate it in a clearinghouse, that somehow de facto you've reduced risk. Uh, I still don't quite understand that analysis, but be that as it may, for those who claim that we need to force more of the... Uh, uh, trades onto the clearinghouse to reduce risk, well, then this is the next logical step. I mean, if you actually believe it will reduce risk, tell the taxpayer to get them out of the bailout business. So I want to applaud the gentleman from Alabama for, for his leadership, and I would hope uh, with the narrowed provision that it would hopefully receive bipartisan support uh, and be a part of the ultimate legislation that's passed, and I yield back the balance of my time. Any questions?